Okay, hey everybody. Another Boston WordPress meetup. Um, thanks for coming out. So we just started doing two sessions. We don't have a second session today, so this is the advanced session, just so you know. Um, we couldn't get the beginner one together. A couple of people dropped out, so apologies for that. Um, thanks for filling out the question that we had when you RSVP'd about what would you like to change about the meetup. We got a lot of great feedback, a lot of new people. Um, oh, I didn't realize it. Yeah, cool. Um, <laughs> so we have more frequent meetings. I don't think we can handle that right now. Sorry, we will try to do that. Different pizza. Well, it's free, so we'll try. Right. Well, I like the pizza. So, oh, so the Wi-Fi code actually isn't working right now. Um, yeah, unfortunately, that's actually a Microsoft issue. Uh, so if you log in and register as a user, uh, you should be able to get an all-day pass. They won't spam you. Yeah. <laughs> What's the name? You can use uh, Boston uh, WordPress Meetup as the, as the Microsoft sponsor. Oh, let me, let's go back. So, oh, one thing about the pizza. Um, different pizza, vegan pizza. Um, it all goes back to, I think, this page. Um, we're, we're huge right now, right? We're, we're about 500 <laughs> members. We're over 500 members. Yep. And um, we are looking for sponsors. Um, you know, right now we don't have the accommodations to, to choose different pizza vendors or vegan pizza or even cookies. Um, so, you know, if, if you know any sponsors, let us know. We'll try and set something up, and that way we can give away your swag, um, get some more food, and even some some other drinks. Um, and please leave your feedback. Uh, we welcome it. We we read it and we take it. First. Yeah, the same goes for the location parking. Um, there's not too much we can do about it. We tried to get Microsoft to, you know, subsidize that, but that's not an option. Um, I think it's like $10. It's the best we can do. And that's where responses can help out, too. Yeah. More demo hands-on. Um, so just a real quick show of hands. Some people have actually asked us about this. So we'll always do the monthly meetup, and it'll be free. But who would be interested in some type of premium like paid thing where it's hands-on, it's a workshop, like we're doing things, you bring your computer, we maybe sit around a table, you're doing what you're doing, we're coming around helping you if you have actual questions specific to what you're working on. Just a quick show of hands, whether it's you want to go to learn or you want to help out and be an instructor, any type of participation, who would be interested in something like that? Uh, depending, we should, that will we'll actively look for sponsors, but it shouldn't be that expensive. Um, I mean, looking at WordCamp Boston, it was like $20, $30 for an entire day. So we probably want to keep it within the same range or less, depending on how many people can fit. Um, alternatively, we are trying to work on, how many of you are true beginners? Just really starting with WordPress. Well, sorry to be here. Yeah. No. Okay, so. That was a trick. This is the advanced session. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we, we, we encourage you to stay. We encourage you to stay for the advanced session. If there's code, if you have questions, Email us, email somebody who really knows the code. Um, you know, this is being recorded, uh, and, and we are, we should be able to get the slides and we'll post those up too. So if you do get lost and have an idea, you know, ask somebody and go back and, and with that code and say, what does this really mean and how do I implement this? Um, we are working on a beginner only workshop. We're looking for somewhere around 20 to 30 people, and we're hopefully going to set that up for the end of next month. So stay tuned, and uh, I'll let you know more about that too. Um, there was another comment about less corporate, more educational topics, how schools and universities use WordPress, and that's something that we can actually um, find some people to talk about. So we'll have that, we'll have those topics moving forward. And uh, the last one was the presenter info, slides, etc. cetera. Um, we do have everything listed on the bostonwp.org. Um, we are filmed graciously by uh, Tom, who's in the back, trbdesigns.com, yeah. and then Nadella in the back, he, I can't remember the company, you want to shout it out? Uptown New Media. Uptown New Media. New Media. Yeah. Um, and, and they're listed on the beginning of each video, so you know, take some time, stop by the site, watch the videos, watch the slides, and the presenter's information will also be posted there, so you can follow up if, they, if you have any questions.
Cool. So. All right, I think that's it. So um, if anybody has any pressing questions, I'm actually holding office hours if you're a real beginner. Um, I'll, I'll be out here to answer any questions that you might have. Um, but I do re really just, I would encourage you to sit through this talk, even if you don't know the code. Um, Not much code, yeah. Oh, even better. <laughs> so I, I'd encourage you to sit and listen. If you do have a pressing question, stop outside and ask me. Cool. Right. Okay, without further ado, um, this is WP workflow. This is the mo one of the, I think it's the most requested topic. Um, Marissa contacted me. She really wanted to help out with this and, and do this. She did a great job. Um, Marissa and Vishesh, she was right there in the front. They're from Green Ferret. And they're really knowledgeable. I worked with them briefly. They put together a great presentation. So I think you'll like it. I'll chime in about certain pieces. But Marissa's going to do the complete presentation. It is BWPM710. So BWPM710. Yeah. Jim, while they're setting up, should people ask general questions? Sure. <laughs> so, who's converted their site to WordPress 3.0? I mean, I mean, that. Nice. You guys are all has behind. It? Who has That's not good. WordPress 3.0. Yeah. Any reasons why? Why? Let me put it this way. Uh, when Microsoft introduces a new version of OS, do you upgrade right away? Yes. Well, you're a braver man than I am. <laughs> yeah, I think Doesn't I mentioned it that. Doesn't it upgrade automatically every time you visit your blog? Hey, you're, not, you're on the hosted version of WordPress.com, so you don't have to worry about upgrades. Oh, okay. No, it's an issue of if, if it has new compelling features, then you would upgrade. If it's not super compelling, why not wait for a dot X. Yeah, no, I think it's, especially with WordPress, I think it's great to work, wait for like a dot, like a 3.0.1 or something like that. Um, some people wait too long and you see sites hacked because um, WordPress, as it gets more popular, gets targeted and people have these scripts that'll just go and look at, is the site running WordPress? What version is it? It's vulnerable and they'll just hack you. They're not looking just to hack you. They just kind of go and sweep through sites that are vulnerable. So it's important. Um, yeah, that's a good point though, you don't want to rush to upgrade the this version. Check your plugins and themes and things like that, but. I had a general question for the group. Um, a friend of mine's running for office. He um, obviously wants to make fun of his opponent, so he, so let's just call his opponent. <laughs> <laughs> so, he wants to, so he wants to have a site like Tom Smith is an idiot, something like that. And his campaign manager, has experience with this and said that the other side can send a takedown letter to the ISP or the upstream ISP. Mm -hmm. And he asked me kind of what I thought about it and I did a little research mm -hmm. and there's something called bulletproof hosting, which I guess is what all the spammers use. And is it a company or is it a No, it's a concept where okay. basically they kind of operate offshore and they in essence don't I mean they just ignore these takedown letters. Hmm. Does anyone have any experience with this? Any thoughts? Any good bulletproof hosting companies? <laughs> I just, does the, does the candidate want to take the negative press of evading an official takedown notice? Well, I, I don't know. It, it, it hasn't happened yet, but I, I've kind of done a little asking around, and apparently what you do is you do it like in the last 
five days of the campaign, and the other side doesn't necessarily get copies of this until like two weeks later or something. <laughs> and so, I mean, you time it just right, and for five days during the key part of the campaign, the site that we thought was operating is, you know. Well, no, I venture to guess that it sounds like has it's a good question for his lawyer to yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like it's not a technical question. Well, no, it's a technical question in terms of. Um, Bulletproof hosting companies. What kind of office is he running for? Attorney General. Okay, so. I'm sorry, what? Cool, the site was mixergy.com where you can hear the podcast. Okay, so I'll give you a little bit of background about me and why I'm qualified to talk about this. Uh, so I've been in development for uh, a little over 25 years. I started out as a developer and then did testing and test management and then I moved over uh, into marketing to do product management, and now I have a company with my business partner, Vishesh uh, Green Ferret. Uh, we uh, help small businesses and uh, technology startups solve business and technology problems. And one of the things on my resume is that I was actually the release manager for Office 97. So, kind of a big project, you know how to keep things in place, as far as a lot of files. So, uh, all right. So, Dancing with the Stars. The reason that I titled it that is, if you think about uh, if you think about dancers, when you see them performing after they've uh, you know they're at that professional level, they they glide and they make things look really really easy. And development is very similar. That you know, there's a lot of work that goes along before that that you have to uh, pay attention to and think about and a lot of details. Um, and when it, everything works and comes together, it's it's kind of like dancing. So just so that I know who I'm talking to in the room, if you're a developer, can you raise your hand? Are you a developer? All right. If you're a designer? Okay. And if you're a dancer? <laughs> okay. So my goal for this presentation is to talk a little bit about uh, using different, uh, different environments for setting up your uh, project, uh, not only the production environment, but also your development platforms. We're going to talk about two different approaches for doing uh, installations and upgrades. Uh, one is going to be leveraging SVN, Subversion, um, and one is going to be using a traditional tarball. <coughs> James is going to talk about the tarball approach. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about handling code versus content, so files versus the content that users are putting in. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about where testing belongs in the process. And we're also going to talk about the importance of having uh, backup and rollback strategies in the overall process. So a few things we're not going to cover. We're not going to talk about multi-site installations, multi-server installations, um, you know, load balancing. We're not going to go through testing theory. That's a whole other Topic, so we're going to assume that you like have some level of appreciation for testing. Um, uh, we're not going to go through a step-by-step -step process on the pieces. It, we, we will go through a step-by-step -step process on the, on the overall process overall, so you see kind of what happens, but there's an expectation that you kind of know how to do each of the little pieces, right? And we're not going to talk about all the other different ways that you can do this, so just the two. So we actually use a three environment approach. So we have the sandbox, which is our, uh, our personal machines where the developers work. And then we have the development environment where we merge things. And also it's a strategy for letting the user have access to the uh, site before it's actually live. And then we have the production site, which is the live site. So I'll go through a little bit about each of those. So on the local machine, uh, a typical installation uh, is that you have one each of 
all the layers that you need, the operating system, the SQL, PHP. Um, and then uh, once you have that installation, then you have multiple customer installations on top of that. So tools to consider for actually creating this type of environment uh, on the Mac. Uh, Mac actually has a lot of that by default, uh, but you might want to upgrade it to whatever the current version is, depending on when you've gotten your, your Mac. Um, so for both Mac and Windows, a tool that is somewhat useful for that is um, XAMPP, which will um, allow you to do kind of the whole installation for you. Uh, they do put a warning on there that says that the, it helps you do the install, but it's up to you to understand the licensing for each of those applications that you're using. So you just want to make sure that you're using them correctly. Is, is XAMPP a tool like Fantastico, like it's a scripted set, set up, install WordPress and Apache and MySQL? So why don't you um, use Fantastico? Yeah, Fantastico is actually another layer on top, so it assumes that you have. I believe it assumes that you have MySQL and Apache and all that stuff. Fantastico just does the WordPress install. This you load What's onto that? your own machine and it gives you the web server, the database, or everything that WordPress needs to install. So it in fact does a uh, you Apache server install. Yeah, okay. and a MySQL. It does right. the LAMP the yeah, stack for right. it. Okay. Yeah, what operating uh, level of Mac do you have to have to do that exam? OS what, the question is what what version of Mac, Mac do you need? I, I think it was on any of them. Any OS 10? Any OS 10? Any OS 10, as long as it's a Unix based OS 10. So what? OS 10 is Unix based, so as long as you have OS 10, you have those things. The, the okay. Intel Max? Intel Max? Yeah. yeah mine's no, it's a, not Intel Max. Mine's an Intel Max, and it works there too. That's okay. It's a Mac. It's a regular old Mac. Okay. <laughs> 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 there, I like that answer. Let's go with that. <laughs> that's, you know. Okay, so the next environment is the development or staging environment. And typically what we do is, uh, because we're often developing things um, concurrently for the same customers, but in our own environment, uh, we need a place where we have whatever the current build is. So once we've done unit testing and um, we have something working on our machine, then we check it in to our uh, source code control management system, and then we actually do a build out of that onto a development server or staging server. And two reasons for doing that. One is that it uh, makes sure that we don't step on each other from a development standpoint. If you're just one developer, um, you can kind of get away with that doing this, but it's really very, very useful to have a place where the customer can go and actually be working on a live site, especially if they're needing to put in a lot of content for new features that you're trying to develop for them. So for example, if they want to be able to go live with the content already there, as opposed to just the structure to put the content in, then it's important to have a place for them to do that that's not the production site. So that's why this is a really good idea. And then, yes? When you say you run a build, what do you use for a build What does that So we'll get to that okay. in a minute. Um, and that's actually, there's kind of two ways that we're going to talk about. So Vishesh uh, and I do it differently, and then James will talk about the way he does it. Um, and then the third environment is the production environment. Um, uh, here there's a few things that you need to uh, think about. So um, often the production environment that you're using may already have a stack installed because the ISP is providing it for you. Um, if you're running your own servers, then you have to install the stack and then you install your WordPress installation on top of that. But typically, you just install the WordPress. And often, in the production environment, the ISP will also have tools for you that allow you to do a lot of that automatically. So. Um, uh, and this is where Fantastico comes in. So I believe it's part of, isn't it part of cPanel? Yes. Yeah, so it's usually there. Um, there have been some mixed reviews about Fantastico. Uh, one is, it's great if you are not really a developer um, because it's kind of a push button thing. Um, what's bad is if something goes wrong, 
then if you actually don't understand the process behind of what's happening for doing an installation, it's really hard to track down what the problem is. Right? So, um, so you can read some more about it. We give you some links at the end of the presentation so you can go and take a look and decide if that's a, a reasonable tool for you. Um, what we actually do is we, um, we're sort of command line people. And so uh, another approach is using uh, make files. And I, there's another tool that uses the make files, which is the Castrato, right? Um, so it's the same sort of concept of make. Does everybody know what a make file is? Yes, no? So a make file basically uh, is a script that runs uh, commands that would be the steps that you would normally take to do the installation. So. Yes. About that. I mean, I'm happy enough with make files and Python scripts, but I imagine those aren't something that you want. Um, the process that you're talking about, would it be something that you could set up in a tool like Dreamweaver? Or would you need, uh, would you need um, uh, an automated uh, tool? Well, I don't know enough about Dreamweaver to know. Does anybody else use Dreamweaver for that? Would you just use a text editor? Why would you use Dreamweaver for that? No, no. If you're if you're, you're building your site in Dreamweaver, yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Okay. So you can use Dreamweaver and then you make your your build scripts. Yeah, they're just two separate things, and just you know, you just pop to a command line to run that script, and as long as it's already built, you yeah. run that command. Um, so some benefits of doing a scripting approach is one, you, you know more about the um, installation and exactly what's happening. So sometimes it's easier to debug problems when they arise. Um, and also it gives you an automated way of doing it so that you're, you're being consistent about how you're doing your installation every single time. Um, and of course we always maintain things in source control because you always want to be able to track the changes that you've made. Which brings us to the next topic, which is source, source code management. So we're big fans of Subversion. Um, I don't know if there's other tools that people like if you want to. GitHub. GitHub. Get. GitHub. 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 Um, you know, the concept is the same. It basically uh, stores files. Uh, ASCII-based files, and it allows you to see what the changes are that you've done. Um, we actually use Subversion as a way to do our installations, and so we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, oh, I guess I'm talking about it now. So, uh, <laughs> so what we actually do is we set up the, uh, the production and the uh, development server to be users of the system. So, you know, on our local machine, we're a user, and we do a checkout, and essentially what we have is a user who is on a user who's on the uh, development server and also on the production. And so what what we do is we check it out to that server so that we we already know what that um, what that build is going to look like because we were just pulling it out. So that's our that's our approach. Um, the big thing is is that this does assume that you have command line access. So if whatever you're using for your ISP provider on your production machines, if you do not have command line access, you know, this probably isn't a good approach for you. Um, but we, we run our own servers, so we, that's how we, we do it. Um, and then the other thing that we do is we, we actually try to keep snapshots of customer data as they, uh, especially if we're continuing to work on their site with additional functionality. So we will take uh, occasional snapshots and put it into source code, which is a little bit different than just doing the backup. So there's a backup process, but then there's also a source code check-in that we do. Good question. Yeah. When you check out to any of those environments, does it bring along like the folder with all the SVN metadata? Is it putting that on the production site too? And uh, there's something called SVN export. Yeah. If you do export, it won't. It basically will take the current snapshot without the SVN metadata. But then you won't have the ability of versioning for that instance that you exported. So you have to keep in mind that the, the entity you've exported is no longer under public control. Right. Anytime you need to update, you need to delete that entry export. Okay. 
so so what that does is it makes it that makes it a little harder if the files change there to do a check-in because you'll have to do an, some additional steps to do that. Okay, so now we've come to the picture portion of our talk. <laughs> so we're going to have pictures and drawings and we're going to have little animations. It'll be exciting. <laughs> okay, so this is the steps for doing a launch. So this assumes that you don't have anything up on your production server. Um, you have your developer sandboxes. You have your uh, storage for your SVN or whatever your favorite source control software is and on your development server you have your data and you have your files so uh, so I just want to make a point about the files uh, you have to have some extra uh, you have to pay extra attention to files that are introduced into the project via the, um, the CMS so when you create a page and you say oh I want a picture in there you pull in a picture and it goes into the file system but it's not in your SVN because it's brought in as data right so one of the things that you have to do is you have to take some extra steps to make sure that you're capturing all of those files that have been brought in via the CMS all right so it, it would make sense like to try to have a subfolder where like all that separate stuff is stored so you can just know it and in effect back up that subfolder rather than having it all spread around uh, yes, that's a good strategy. Sort of like the My Documents in Windows or um, you know, the Documents folder in Mac. The same concept is you have a root directory and then you have whatever your subdirectories are, however you structure that, and then you have one directory that you have to pay attention to. So that's the uploads directory in WordPress. That's all the user generated stuff. Anything that's added in to a post gets put into uploads and it's dated by year. Now is that off WP content or is that off the uh, That's within WP content. Okay. And so it's is it the next level down? Yep. Okay. Okay, so the first step is that all the developers uh, have checked in their code and of course prior to doing that they've done all their unit testing and all the unit testing has passed and we've done the integration testing, so but everything is all checked in and, and you're ready to to do your launch. Um, you want to check in all of your loose files from your development server. So these are the files that we've been talking about. You want, so you want to make sure that they're all part of the project as well. Um, you want to export your data and also check in your data. So that becomes part of the project. Now you want to mark this version. So this is going to be your release to production or whatever you want to call it, but this, this is the version that you're going to promote to production server. Uh, so then what we do is we actually uh, check out the project again so that we make sure that we have a clean, clean installation of that project. We do all of our testing over here to make sure that the entire site is actually what we expect the entire site to be and that it passes all of the tests. And now we're ready to check it out and put it onto the production server, yes. When you do the data transfer, do you drop the databases in? Because the staging data is the staging server that we use in our process, we actually allow the client to put in data. So that I guess the reason I did that, and that's just my own thing, is that, that way you can't end up with sort of residue that somebody put in there that turns out to be little stuff that's required for it to work right that isn't there on production. Yeah. So so that's where good data management 
comes into play. Uh, but the other thing you don't want on the production server is you don't want a bunch of junk that shouldn't really be there, right? So moving over the entire data isn't, well, that, that wouldn't be an approach that we typically use because what's happened over here is that there's a bunch of things in there that are test data and test whatever and you just don't want them on production. So really what you want to do is you want to check out the data that is appropriate if we're going over there and that's what you're checking out. So sometimes that's going through the specific tables that you want. Um, you know, sometimes that's um, taking out some data or moving some stuff around or you extract some and then you know, check and make sure that your, the data that you want is clean. You know, this is all, that's all part of the testing process. So, so we go through this step to make sure that we're checking out the right things and that, that, the, that the build that we're, that we're gonna do here is the correct data. So, I don't know, does that answer your question? Yeah, I guess what I really just want to say, do you have a good MySQL diff tool to be able to look at a live database or table and dip it with another one and see what the differences are without having to do an extract? So for Mac, there's a, I think it's available to Windows to uh, diff merge. Do what, I'm sorry? Diff merge? Yeah. Well, yeah, but so when you're doing, you're pulling the data out of the server and then checking into the merge, or is that? Yeah, I'm looking for it. I used to work with other database servers, and I was hoping for a tool that could actually access the server live and compare it in place. Yeah, I think it's open source uh, available on most platforms. Okay. Okay. So just to follow up on that, because I'm not quite as familiar. So you're exporting, you're exporting, say, the SQL that would do that, and then you're doing a text. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right, so now we check out the project over on SVN, the files and the data. Do another test. And we say it's good. So ship. Yes. The uh, SVN approach you're talking about, is it only applied to the WordPress project? No. Uh, we actually do this in Drupal, and uh, I'm assuming that it would work in Joomla. So this, that approach, this process, is a, is a, it's about a process, not really about the specific tools. It's tool agnostic, if you will. So okay. it should work on anything. It's really just it's the steps that you need to take. Yeah, I know you don't want to talk about automated testing, but could you just mention which automated testing tools you use, if you use any? Um, so currently, most of the sites that we've worked on are not sites that actually require uh, the investment in automated tools. But I do mention some, I, I have some links to some sites that can give you some information okay. about that. Okay. Um, I would have guessed that the uh, developer sandbox's work on that code is the, the outcome of that is files. I thought that, that title number one would have actually gone up to the development stage. Oh, that was before. Files. Yeah, no, so you, you always check in and then you check out. You never you never go directly here. Everything goes through the SBN. Okay. So you check in, check out. You know, check in, check out. Everything goes through here. And that way everybody has the same version. Okay. Okay. Just toss in what, what that prevents, even though it seems like an extra step, is where you made the one character modification on the file that's on your machine, that without which it won't work, <laughs> and then nobody else has it, or you don't get it into your client build when you publish it to your server. Right. <laughs> okay, so you've released your production, and everybody's happy, time passes, and everything's in sync. We're very happy. Development keeps going. You're putting in more data, creating more files, the customer is being good. They're helping that SEO on their content, <laughs> putting in more stuff, putting in more files. And of course, and of course, there are different files than what you're doing on development. Uh -huh. So now this is out of sync. This is out of sync. Everything's out of sync, right? So how do you get things back in sync for doing your upgrading? So essentially what you're doing is this here, right? So we actually use the development as the trunk of our, of our branching, of our source code. 
um, this will have been the launch version. And so if you think of production as a branch off of that, so development keeps going, actually there's some branching, so there's some, really some development stuff that's happening over in production. And what you really need to do is get a merge to happen so you can create an up, update version, okay? Everybody following what's gonna happen? Okay, so now we're gonna divide that, you know, that picture we're going to do it in four big steps because there's lots of little steps for each of these, okay? So the, the basic steps are we're going to do a preparation in case we have to do a rollback because, as we know, not everything is always perfect and something is always going to happen. So you want to be prepared to be able to pull everything off the server when it goes awry so you can put it back to where it was. You're going to do all the steps for prepping the upgrade. So this is packaging everything that you need that's going to go for the, the new version. You're going to test that upgrade and make sure that the process for doing all the steps to take your production state to your upgrade state works before you put it out on production. Um, and then you're going to actually, once you're happy with that, then you're going to do the upgrade on production. Okay. All right, so we're going to do these one at a time. So we're going to start with the prep for the rollback contingency. All right, so here's our state of where everything is. We're going to introduce a new, a new environment here. We're going to have our test environment. And the reason we do that is because usually by this time, there's other things that we're doing on the development server that might be the version after. And what we don't want to do is we don't want to wipe this out and just to use it for testing of an upgrade. So we're going to introduce a new, a new platform. The closer this platform can be to production, the better it is for you because production is never, ever, ever like your development server. Right? So the, closest, the closer you can get that environment to look like production, the easier it is. All right, so first thing, check in code. Right? Kick off all the users. This is really important. You need a stable state of production. So you kick them off and you, um, and you make sure that no one can log in and just say, you know, you're, you're going to wait. So you're going to check in all those files, extra files, you're going to check those in to the database. And you're going to check in the export into here as well. Okay, so you have essentially what you're going to end up with is this is, uh, well, I know image is the wrong word, but you're basically going to have a snapshot of production, you know, what's on production at this point. And then you're going to mark that version, okay? And you're going to say this is production, all right? So this is the version that if all things break loose and you need to go back, that's what you're going to check out to production. So you're going to be able to go back to where you were, okay? Quick question there. Yeah. Um, so the developer code is consistent with your development system. So what you're avoiding putting not in there. Not necessarily. This might okay. actually be ahead of this. Gotcha. There might be more stuff here. All right. Because we're still working. But what you're avoiding putting in there is is the MySQL database, the, the stuff that you're doing on. What? So not code, but... Well, this is production. Right. So this is what the user has been putting in. Right. They're happy with their version 1.0 site, and yep. they're adding to it, yep. right? So all this step is, is you're just preserving that so you right. can get back to that. So we have three more steps to go Right. that we'll talk about getting all the other stuff in. So. Okay, but the, yeah, I guess my question is you've got some advanced stuff from the developer sandboxes, but not all the, the stuff that you're doing in development. Why code, not the rest? Because that's in step two that we haven't gotten to yet. So this is this is prep for rollback. No, I understand you're getting ready to do that. Why this sequence? Why did the sandbox is now not the next one? Since you really want to I, see, I see the question. Why is why here? Right. You know, step two. That's, that's probably from my old days in doing big 
projects where yeah. you know you have check-in day and that's the last day and gotcha. so okay probably have it fine I'm happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, do you have something else to raise? Another, another potential answer. Yeah. So that's, that disc has gone from cheap to absurdly cheap. Fine. Doing another check-in doesn't cost it. <laughs> 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 I was just wondering if the it's sequencing sure, costs. It's absolutely it. sure you've got. You know, yeah. Plus when you're stuff. marking the data for rollback, the content that you need to get for rollback is yeah. on the production side. It's not on the that's why I was asking. Yeah, that's why I was asking. Yeah, why, why do the sandbox? Why do the Have it. That's fine. Yeah, it <laughs> makes sense. It's because I used to be in charge of like, you know, 40 developers. And yep. Have to what? have a check. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> okay. Okay, so that was the first one. Now we're going to prep the upgrade. So you can check in here if you want. <laughs> All right, so we're going to check in the files here. Check in the data. Now we got to merge the files. Okay, so you have all that new stuff from production from the customer, and you have all the new stuff from the new development of the next version, and you have to merge everything. And now we're going to mark that. That's our upgrade. Okay. All right. Now we're going to test the upgrade. So, as you might suspect, we're going to go into this test environment. So the first thing we do is we put in the production project. So we want this to look like production, okay? So we're gonna start with production because what we're gonna do is we're gonna emulate what's gonna happen on the production server. So we start with production, right? Now we're gonna check out the files. Uh, you know, checking out the files, by the way, it's gonna create all your new tables that you need. Now you can put in your data for those new tables. Of course, you're going to test this release and the release process. So we might do this a couple of times before we get it right. Because you know, you always forget something, something doesn't quite work, whatever. So you have to be able to, um, to test this part of it to make sure it's going to work correctly. OK, so here's our status. And now we're going to actually upgrade production. So now what we want to do, we've tested this. We've tested the test server. We're happy with it. We think this is what we're going to go with. So now what we have to do is we have to bring production to make that look like the test. Okay? And there's always going to be something a little different with your production platform. So you're still going to go through the steps. You got to check out the files, add your data, test the release, right? And then party. Um, one la a couple of last points here that I want to make. So when you test the release and the re release doesn't work, you need to kind of go back to the beginning. Now sometimes, if you if you have a lot of experience and you can kind of go back one step or four steps, that's okay. But often, really what you have to do is you have to go back to the first step, right? Because there might have been something somewhere. Some file wasn't checked in is usually what's happened. So you have to go all the way back to the beginning, checking the files. So, okay. All right. Questions? Yeah, I've been just kind of looking at this process. I'm trying to think. You know, the, the most important thing in engineering is try to prevent the error from happening in the first place. Mm -hmm. What strikes me is you've got you know a small number of developers working for you. Hopefully, you're kind of doing what they're supposed to. But you can't control what the users, right? They're, they're the wild card. So it seems to me that you shouldn't. The users should never have access in terms of, of changing the production server. They shouldn't have an account on that. They only have an account on development, and they should only be able to access one folder or subfolder in the development server. So what do you mean by not having access? Because well, they're they, managing the content. They have lots of access. Well, they, they should manage it at the development server, not at the production server. Well, the, the production server is their live server. They need to be putting the content out on their production server. Well, no, I would argue that they should, they should put it on the development server and then you sync up the development server with it. So on WordPress.com, well, you're saying no users are allowed to blog, they're only allowed to blog on the development server? Well, but, but you're, this, that's, a, that's a different type of system. No, that's, no, that's, that's what we're talking problem. about right here. That's what you're talking about. Well, that's, that's uh, the okay. data that I'm talking about right there, is the blogs. The production is the mm -hmm. public system that everybody uses. Mm -hmm. Oh, so you're actually talking about users like creating entries in WordPress, mm -hmm. for example. Yeah. So that, okay, well, fine, okay. Yeah, content. That's content. 
I thought you meant they were like uploading like uh, PDFs or like files to something. Well, that, that too, that's the files, right? So, you know, they, they can do anything on their server. It's their, it's their website. They want to be able to control that. Well, yeah, but if, if they could only upload files to your, your development server and then you had an automatic sync or something between them, a lot of these problems I think would never happen in the first place. I think working with clients, it's tough to get a client to buy into that. I mean, like if you create, create say, like a WordPress magazine and style it's website, it's right? Not only about have, clients, it's the, about the time. The clients have the clients. website is a product for users to be used. You have to allow them to put stuff there, right? Mm -hmm. right. I mean, yeah. if you're building you a website else. that users will use, you have to allow them to access. Okay. Um, there's something else I was going to say about this. Uh, Oh, and then last step, don't forget to let the users back onto the production site. <laughs> 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 Very important stuff. <laughs> okay, so uh, James, want to talk about this part? Sure. This part is yours. So, um, the upgrading WordPress stuff, hopefully you guys are familiar with that. There's a great document on the codex for that. Um, there's another process kind of called the Tarball and Go process. <laughs> Um, so, has anyone ever heard of a tool called Capistrano? No. Okay. So that originally started, it's actually written in Ruby, so not PHP. Um, you'd have to install something, a language called Ruby, on your local machine to get that. And then Capistrano is a, is a set of scripts that you get um, for free that can run on your local machine. So Capistrano was created originally for um, building large-scale web applications and deploying them. Uh, they're created with something called uh, Rails, which is a framework. It's Totally off topic, but it, it was a tool to enable people to deploy really large websites. And if you look at um, the deployment process, like we've been talking about, there's a lot of steps. And if you do them over and over again, you find that these are things that you could script. So the folks that have created Capistrano have seen kind of this is what people do every day. Let's build this magical set of tools and just kind of do it for you. Um, I'm going to admit right now that I've never used it with WordPress. So I've used it for what it's supposed to be used for, and it's amazing. It took me um, a few hours to set up, and it, 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 does a bit, it does things a bit differently. It can be configured to do what Marissa has described here. So it will tell your production server to check out the code right under the server. Um, I originally had it set up like that. I then realized that you need to maintain your, like if you're gonna do upgrade your uh, source control software like Subversion, you're gonna then need to upgrade that on your production server you're going to have to have your production server be able to talk back to your development server. That may introduce security issues. It seemed to be me more to manage. right? So you can also configure it to do it a different way. What it will do is you literally type, once you have everything set up, you invest a few hours doing this, you type um, one command, and it will run your series of, kind of pre-programmed steps. It will go out to your, um, actually I have this. Yeah. So it will go out and fetch your latest code from your source control, whatever it may be. It may be Git, it may be some version, it works with everything. Um, it will exclude any files from your release. So maybe you have, um, let's say, documents in your source control or things that you actually don't want to go to production. It will take those out. It will package and optionally compress them into a single file, a tarball or a zip file, or whatever you want to call it. It will upload that and unpackage it to your production server into a dated release, so the date that you actually release that. And it, through different methods, there's FTP, there's SCP, there's different kinds of methods, so it's fully configurable. And then what a lot of people do is they set up their site to, to point to a, a folder called current. And when they release code, they, they have that folder. It's not really a folder, it's a link. And they have that pointed to the latest dated release. So the script will make this new directory, put all your code there, and switch your current to point to that. <coughs> so you can imagine the benefit of that, because rolling back is just switching that link to the previous date when yeah, you roll back. Yep. So this is a file system link? Yes. It's not a web redirector. No, 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 it's a file system link. Yep. Um, the shared user generated stuff that we talked about, so customers are uploading things like that. You can put that in a certain place, and this will then go and, and change those links. So your new dated release now points to the shared place, so the, the shared data isn't tied to, it's not checked in and tied to the release itself. Right? It's in a shared place, and it just will update the link to now point to that shared place. So it's not like it gets blown out when you put a new release in. And then the whole concept of this runs on, basically, the, a, a 
a concept called tasks. So the deploy task will do all that for you. Once you configure it, you get all of that. Then there's other tasks, you can add your own tasks, right? So let's say there's a certain thing that you always have to do when you deploy, and it's just a specific to your environment, it's kind of a headache. You can add that as a custom task. So from your local machine, um, you start this by typing cap, space, deploy. So you get all of this. Then you can do your own tasks, like maybe cap, uh, deploy, colon, cleanup. Maybe cleanup is a special task that you've written that goes in and uh, removes you know, certain log files, or it does whatever it needs to do, specific to your um, you know, setup. So this is written in Ruby. You have to know a little bit about Ruby. I'm, I haven't used it with WordPress, but if you Google Capistrano in WordPress, you will see that people are using this. They're using it for all kinds of things, not just what it, its original intention. And you'll see people posting the full recipe of how they're doing it with WordPress, their deployment file. So it's kind of this master file that says this is everything that will be done. And a lot of people are doing blog posts and offering up their solution for this is how to do it with WordPress. This sort of recipe works great. Um, if anyone's ever used that before, or it makes sense to kind of try it out, I'd love to try it out and maybe do a session on it. Or I think it's, once you have this set up, it's just amazing. It's one command. I feel like it's going to break every time and it just works flawlessly. <laughs> it's, built, it does, it's just too easy. It's built-in rollback, and it'll just it'll do all kinds of things for you. So the deploy tasks are it knows how to go out and call my SQL, or it's just running a shell command or something. Yep. Um, the, the 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 database piece is very specific to the Rails platform, which it's used to working with. Um, I think you'll find the recipes for handling the database stuff for WordPress in what people have put out onto the internet. This, uh, this looks a lot like Ant, actually. I think it's just like, I, yeah, okay. it's kind of Ruby community's Ruby version of it. Version. Yep. Okay. So the, the, the cap files are essentially make files. Mm -hmm. That's essentially what this is. It's your full recipe of everything that must be done. And so I'm currently, I do this manually. So. I'd love to do it with WordPress and to see it work with WordPress. And it's really reassuring to see people talking about it and releasing their versions of how they've gotten it to work. So something to uh, explore. It's kind of the reverse. Rather than having your production server pull everything to source control, you're building it and pushing it out. Um, it can do both. It will work both ways. So you know, WordPress, it comes with the distribution. So if you lost everything and you downloaded the latest version of WordPress, your WP content directory is all your themes, your plugins, and user uploaded content. That's sort of your aside from your database. So a combination of your WP content directory and your database are the things you really want to preserve. Make sure you have backups of those when dealing with WordPress. Uh, a couple of things. I, I'm managing some people that are a uh, team that's using, been using Subversion for a couple of years. And a couple of things we've learned the hard way is you really got to write down a step-by-step -step process for the order in which you do things in Subversion. So what we do is first we check out, then you develop test, then you check out again to make sure that any other changes that people have checked in in the meantime are now included in yours. Test again and only then commit. If you do it the other way around, you're asking for trouble. Trouble like having to manually merge other developers? Yes, changes. right. Second is every time you, you commit, you can make notes about what you did it's, it, it's, you know, it takes a couple minutes and it's worth it because when you're trying to figure out who you know, screwed up the build, you can, it, those notes can be very helpful. Yeah, definitely. If you're working on a large team, definitely enforce detailed notes. Like, like I've seen notes like change the link. And it's like, oh man, you know, what link did you change? You have to go through it. <laughs> <laughs> it really doesn't take that much time to provide a little bit more detail. We're using um, Tortoise and Ant, uh, two client-based tools that interface to Subversion. Subversion is really a server-based system. So you want to have something, now this is under Windows, I don't know how it would be under Linux or Mac, whether Tortoise or not are applicable. But these make it much easier when we're working with Visual um, uh, Studio to basically, in effect, ping Subversion. We basically you work within your development environment and you, you really kind of hide the Subversion complexity for you. Yeah, and there's clients for Mac, Windows, Know, some version clients and things like that for all those systems. Visual are definitely nice to use. Is this your slide? Is this? No, not. Okay. Okay, I guess it's one. <laughs> oh. All right, so these are just some notes about uh, synchronizing your data, so some things to think about. Um, 
So uh, you can either do things manually if you know some SQL. You can also use my PHP to uh, look at your data. Um, I think we we actually went over a few of these things as we were talking through the process. But you know, mark the tables that you want for exporting. You don't have to export the entire database. If, if there's really only a subset that you're looking at that you want to be able to export, um, you can do that. Um, the when you create your, um, when you do the file part of it, so so uh, when you install, uh, you know, I'm thinking in Drupal right now instead of WordPress. So it, when you when you get your um, upgrade out there, what it does is it actually creates the tables um, for you, so that then you can put your um, your data in. I don't think there's any time when you need to create tables manually in WordPress, is there? Um, I guess if you're building a new plugin that has new tables. Perhaps you, you so would. installing the plugin doesn't automatically. Uh, you can do that. You can hook okay. that in. If you write the plugin as you know as you're supposed to, there are hooks to have it in create and drop. So right. I guess you're right. Right. And then a, a couple of notes about data merging. So um, one thing to think about data merging is to really try to manage the process <coughs> externally. So one of the things that we try to do is we try to help the user, help the customer understand that production is for production stuff and development is for development stuff. So, and they shouldn't be trying to do things on the wrong server. So what that means is that even though the development server may have the same functionality that's present on their production, they should not be putting that, they should not be using the development server to test out their content. They should be using the publishing features on production to manage that content. So they should put that out on production, manage it with the publishing uh, switches, and not not do that on the development server. Sort of I don't quite understand what you're saying. Any yeah. more specific, specific example of yeah. either doing it right or doing it wrong? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so uh, say they have some uh, some blogs that they're working on. They should be, you know, that functionality is available on their production server. They should put the blogs in and have it unpublished, right? They shouldn't be just because they happen to be on the development server working on the new features that you're going to provide in the next release. They shouldn't say, oh, by the way, I need to write this blog. Let me just go over there. Oh, and assume the data is going to come And assume that the data is going to come over there. Exactly. Because it's not going to so happen. So you assume that anything that a test or developer is thrown. Correct. Right. And in fact, when we when we develop features, what we do is we get them to put in just enough data so that we can test it and tell them, you know, uh, unless we've made an agreement that they're going to fully populate that particular feature with data, that data is going away, and they're going to have to put it in on production. All right, we'll move along here. Okay, just a couple of notes about testing. We're not going to really talk about automated testing. It's okay. All right, so um, <laughs> always, we, the production server is never, ever, ever the same as the development server. No matter how hard you try, even the testing, if you're on, even on the same platform, there's always going to be something that's going to be just slightly different. So it's really important to test in, you know, across all of your environments. Um, and of course, everybody knows about browser compatibility. Again, you know that's one of the things that you really need to look at as you put it to a new uh, release platform. You should just do a little bit of browser testing as part of a last a last check. Um, and then we give you a link here for if you want to know more about automated test tools. They they actually have a, a huge list of things that you can look at. All right. Um, ongoing backup is a little bit different than rollback. Uh, we talked about how to do marks, marking your uh, content so that you have that for doing rollback and you know, the pointing to a different directory also for doing rollbacks. Uh, there are some, um, uh, in general, for doing uh, backups, uh, there are some tools for doing that. And you can also look at your service provider. The service provider might be able to uh, provide some of that. But you, you really want to ask about costs because sometimes they charge uh, different different sorts of rates depending on what you need for backups and how frequently you're 
you're doing that. Um, as alternatives, you know, rent some space out in the cloud, you have your own servers, <coughs> you know, even putting something on external hard drives. Uh, but you want to make sure that you're that the that you have multiple backups in different places, so that if one fails, you have another place to go back to. Um, I don't know, do you want to say something about the services, Vault Press and iDrive? No, those are the ones that have been recommended, um, that I just hear being recommended. Uh, Vault Press is actually from Automatic, so the folks that do WordPress. Uh, I think it's in beta or something. You need to sign up and they'll invite you. Uh, it'll be, I think, a really a small fee, but it supposedly just hooks right into WordPress. It's a, it's a plug-in, I think, and it'll just sync all of your stuff and they'll hold it securely for you. Um, I haven't used it yet, but I think it's free to try right now while it's suggesting. I may not see it. No. <laughs> all right, uh, and we talked about this, um, that you know you don't want to wait till the launch date <laughs> to actually try it out. So you know, try, try it a little bit before so you can work on all the kinks, okay? Um, so in the slide deck here, I've provided, this is the, a list view of that same thing that we went through. And this is also a list view of the upgrade checklist. So when you have the slides, you'll have access to this. Um, these are all the tools that we mentioned throughout the slide presentation. So you have one place to look for that. So now everybody's smarter about uh, backups and production servers and code and content, right? All right. Any other questions? Yeah. It, it seems like you know Drupal pretty well. Yeah. Um, could you just very quickly give a summary? I mean, this is like a WordPress only group, but mm -hmm. so you're always kind of wondering about those other things you hear about. Really. So, how would you compare Drupal to WordPress? Uh, strengths and weaknesses about Drupal? So, uh, so I would think of WordPress as focused on um, certain types of sites it's very good for that my understanding of the version that's coming out they do a little bit more to look at a general um, web type of approach um, you know I, I guess I would talk about three different ones right so there's WordPress which is you know it's a, it's a great product for doing um, you know, websites that are focused really on news constant updating you know, blog types of things. I mean, that's what it was designed to do, really. And it's really excellent at that. And they're trying to broaden it so that it's much more of a general CMS. And I think some of the, the, the version that's coming out is doing a lot more to improve that capacity for that product. Um, Joomla is much more started out as a content management system in general, not specifically about blogging. And Drupal also is, is really in, about general content management for just general websites. And the difference between Joomla and Drupal, from my perspective, is um, Joomla is, is a great product from a, a usability user standpoint, because it's very easy to use. Um, you know, the user interface is fairly simple to understand. Uh, the place where it kind of falls down is if you have to scale. So if, you, if you're going to expect that you're going to have a really large site, uh, if you want to be able to do a lot more custom types of things, then you know Drupal, which is more geared toward kind of a development environment or a developer approach, um, is a better platform for that. So, and that actually looks at the kind of the history of that. So, so developers will also often go with the Drupal platform, and non-developers often go with Joomla. And so, if you look at the community and you look at the the modules and the add-ons that are available, you have lots of things. You have a huge, huge library of things for Drupal that are open source because all the developers are sharing with each other. And a little bit what happens with Joomla is things tend to be more paid types of add-ons <laughs> because the, the people who are designers more than developers aren't developing things themselves. And so they're kind of stuck with having to get things from people who aren't developers. So um, that's not true of everything for Joomla, but you know, if you look at it kind of at, a, at the big picture level, that's that's well, what WordPress people like me always hear is that the other two sites are better for e-commerce, the other two platforms are better for e-commerce sites. 
Well, there are there are products that plug into them fairly easily. So there's a Virtue Cart for Joomla, I believe, or Vir Virtue Mart <coughs> for Joomla, and there's um, uh, uh, Open Uber Cart, right? Uber Cart for uh, Google. I'm sorry, I'm old and sometimes I forget. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I've been using Subversion uh, for several projects, but never where I had to keep a database under version control, so I'm just wondering, from you or anyone in the audience who's got experience with this, um, how... It's, it's for ASCII files, it's not for databases. Uh, I know, but yeah. they've got, but you've got data under version control. Export. So you export, and I'm just trying to picture what happens on the other end. So on the other end, you check out, and what after that? You rebuild the database from what you check out? So yes, there are there are instances, instances where you can completely get rid of the database that's up there right. and load the export that you have. Okay. But there are instances where you have changes or differences between the export that you have and the data that's on there. So you export so that? So you export that, diff it, and see if the difference is relevant or you need that difference. If you don't need that difference, you go with the one that you have gotcha. checked in. And basically, the times when we don't need the difference or we don't need the data is when we are actually working with the development server. Uh -huh. Because the data that's there in the development server is almost all the time test data. Yeah. And except the first time when it's launching. Yeah. The first time when it's launching the development server, we use it as you know, not only as a staging uh, development server, but also as a staging server. Okay. Because the site is not up yet. Right. Sure. But once the site is up, that becomes the state. That's the stage, right? That's where people are going to look. So you really don't care about the data that's there on the server. So and that you point. never merge, right? You, that, that just sounds like so a mess. Well, you merge when you look at the, the diff SQL. and see if, yeah, you look at the diff and see if it's, Relevant. So line by line, you might decide, okay, yes. merge, replace this with that. Right. Okay. All right. All right. And then you build the database. You get rid of it and build it with. Yeah. Just check all the drop. Wow. Okay. Just all right. Got it. Just get my head around it. Thank you. All right. So hopefully you're all now stars, dancing with the stars, and <laughs> being graceful, and out there and win that little. Trophy ball. <laughs> 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 and this will be available on, on yes. the okay. yeah. video okay. slides. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Oh, wait, wait, a service announcement. So uh, we are doing uh, a couple of projects, and we're interested in finding some designers who can work with us. And do reasonable stuff, but we, we're looking for somebody who can kind of make that you know, more make it graphic design pop. Background. Yeah, can you really like do that. Artists or well, someone who can, you know, our our sites are clean and functional, and you know, clean and functional. And we want somebody we're looking who can. For artwork, we so. <laughs> we're looking for someone who can kind of make it pop and wow. So, if you're interested, just chat with us up. Do you have a budget? A budget. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I mean, that's true, which I've got several people to recommend, but they, <laughs> <laughs> they actually charge money. <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, we have customers. Well, what the number is. I just so, so we have customers, and we talk to them about you know, how much it costs. And okay. usually what we try to do is we try to ask them their budget and try to work within their, their budget. Okay. okay, thanks. Thanks.